This edition of the Northern Miner Podcast is sponsored by Mine Expo International, the world's largest mining trade show. See thousands of new products and services at the Las Vegas Convention Center from September 28th to 30th. Registration is now open, so visit MineExpo.com to register. You don't want to miss this opportunity. This is Global Mining News, available worldwide on the internet. Welcome to the Northern Miner Podcast. My name is Adrian Pocabelli. I am your editor and host. And it just seems like sentiment has shifted in the last week and a half, doesn't it? The fear of the virus is getting replaced by fear of the economy. And so now there's just a rush to open everything up. You're seeing it with the mines, too. Everybody's starting to open back up. Yeah, and you're also seeing a lot of M&A at the same time. You wonder if with all those depressed prices in the mining shares, I mean, we had it like a month ago on the Northern Miner front page. Miners debate M&A as COVID-19 sends shares lower. And all of a sudden, there's a huge amount of M&A. I think we were prescient on that. I think we were on topic, and I think we were right so isn't that interesting? And here we have this uh, big Shandong. It's not Chinese, it's not state run, but it's state owned gold company. As far as I understand, Shandong, they have taken over TMAC resources 100%. And so that was a bit of a head turner. And there is more MA we have just on today's front page here. Uh, we have. SSR Mining and Alistair Gold are merging in a zero premium all share deal. So this episode, we're going to take a look at the Newmont conference call. And we have Tom Palmer, the president and CEO. And what I've done is I've taken certain excerpts. And we also have the chief operating officer who said some pretty interesting stuff about robots. I have about a couple of minutes from Rob Atkinson. And he just sort of snuck in how the robots are really going to help them. And I just thought, what? It's really interesting how they're selling the automation as a safety feature. It's better if we put a robot in the mine than a person because it's just safer for that person. One wonders, though, what happens to that person's job uh, once they're safe and not needed in that mine. Who knows? All speculation over here, as per usual. You know, Newmont, again, it's kind of like the blue chip of blue chip of gold stocks. If we go back, uh, Barrick about a month ago was saying how their 10-year plan was to have 5 million ounces of gold production per year. And here Newmont just has said that they are doing 6 million ounces per year. Newmont keeps its dividend. I think they just raised the dividend. They're continuing their buybacks which is quite interesting in this environment. And if you look at the stock, uh, Newmont's stock has really taken off here. Uh, So it really is, I think, my perspective is that Wall Street sees Newmont as a nice proxy for gold with a little bit of leverage in there. And as you're going to hear in the call, there, yeah, there really is leverage in these gold stocks. I think at one point he says for every $100 higher in the gold price, is leads to something like $400 million cash flow or something. So anyways, listen for that. We're, so that's our main feature of the day. And yeah, we're going to tour around the world a little bit. we got the Russia-US space mining story, and I love those stories. So we are definitely going to go into that. We have Anglo-American spinning off South African coal mines. The, the timing is always interesting of all of these things with this virus. You know, as the saying goes, never let a good crisis go to waste. And you've seen all sorts of stuff. And we also have a story on Rio Tinto and their emissions cuts. Uh, investors are facing off over it. And I can't say I'm surprised. I mean, I believe we, we mentioned this last show. They're spending a billion dollars to reduce their emissions. I mean, this is not small money and it's not enough. Uh, for a lot of investors. And hey, I you know I don't know all the numbers of Rio Tinto. Maybe they're right. I, I'm not sure. But we're going to take a closer look at that because it's getting pretty heated. 
Because if you do feel it's enough and you got people asking for more, you might think this is getting out of hand here. But let's just take a look. Uh, I have I want a clean earth. So let's take a closer look and see what's going on here. So lots to look forward to. What else do we have here? We have the Canadian Mining Symposium. It is one month, one week, and one day away. I believe it's June 16th to June 18th. And uh, yeah, you can register for free. Uh, just go to our Twitter page at Northern Miner. I believe we have a pinned tweet at the top. Or go to our website and hover over events and click on 2020 Canadian Mining Symposium. And yeah, Sean Boyd, as we've mentioned in previous episodes, is going to be there. He's also on TNM Leaders too. If you want a free interview of Sean Boyd really opening up about leadership, that is a must-see. And they have Don Lindsay is also going to be presenting at the conference. And Randy Smallwood, Gord Stotthart, Joe Foster, and Jeffrey Christian. So it is an all-star show as usual with the Canadian Mining Symposium. So it's something to look forward to. So just a last point on the sentiment shift. I heard this great thought on financial radio, and I think it came from a Goldman Sachs report where they were saying that the stock market is basically pricing in a V-shaped recovery. And meanwhile, the real economy is definitely not V-shaped, maybe more of a Nike swoosh, as people say, and that at a certain point, these narratives need to converge. And so we know the stock market is a forward-looking indicator, but right now things are out of whack. So it'll be interesting to see which happens. Will the real economy recover really quickly or are we heading lower in stock prices or do we continue the divergence? So we shall see with anticipation. In the meantime, you can find us online at northernminer.com, on Twitter at Northern Miner, on Instagram at The Northern Miner, on Facebook, YouTube, where we host these podcasts, and LinkedIn and also wherever podcasts are available, including Spotify, Google Podcasts, and of course, Apple Podcasts on the news. And turning to the website, we have the Shandong Gold to buy TMAC Resources for $149 million. And I was, you know, it's interesting in the intro, I was saying, well, it's not state run, but it's state owned. I don't know if it's state-run or not. Like, is that a distinction without a difference? If it's state-owned, doesn't that imply that it's state-run? Anyway, so I just highlight that because I think it's important because it it really does make China a bit of a special situation. That's in a sense, you see the tension between this kind of state-run capitalism out of China and kind of free market capitalism that we have, let's say, in the West. So let's look into this story and see if we can learn a little more. In the latest Chinese acquisition of a Canadian gold miner, Shandong Gold is buying TMAC Resources and its Hope Bay Gold project in Nunavut for $149 million. The news follows Zijin Mining's acquisition of Continental Gold in March for $1.3 billion and a bid from Silvercorp Metals, which I believe is also Chinese-owned, for Guiana Goldfields in April for $105 million. So three moves from three different Chinese mining entities. Three acquisitions. Now, we've brought this up on earlier episodes too, this sort of drip, drip, drip. There's a lot of strategery, it seems, in the timing. And this is all speculation on my part, but there is strategery in the timing that things don't happen too close together. And you see when they do, it's sort of spread out across even something like silver corp metals. I'm not trying to be hard on China, but I think we need to look at what's going on here simply by virtue of the fact that we're dealing with state-run capitalism. So it's just a different kettle of fish when they start to buy resources of other countries. And as sort of just adding to that idea, like let's look at just last week's front page of PNG clashing with Barrick and Zijin mining over the Porgera mine. There were uh, reports coming out from these strange, like they look like front websites, like almost fake websites, but there it was dealing with supposedly real news of the PNG Porgera dispute where the Chinese government was supposedly saying that relations would be damaged 
if, in fact, the PM decided to basically take over the mine on ESG grounds because there was a lot of problems with the locals and that this would damage relations. So you see, this isn't just upsetting a company. This is upsetting a very powerful country all of a sudden. So when Canada opens its doors and says, yeah, buy the mine, this isn't the same thing as as it appears to me as, say, Newmont coming in and buying TMAC resources or uh, an Australian or uh, you name it, a Japanese, because the government is not owning that entity and threatening on behalf of that entity to protect that asset. Like when Barrick, just to finish the point, when Barrick had problems with PNG, I didn't hear anything from the government of Canada threatening relations with PNG. Okay, and that's the difference. So back to our story. Under the latest M&A deal, Shandong Gold will pay $149 million in cash to acquire all of TMAX shares for $1.75 per share. The offer marks a 52% premium to TMAX 20-day volume-weighted average price as of May 6th, and the Canadian company's key shareholders, Resource Capital Funds, and Newmont support the transaction. RCF Newmont own a combined 58.6% stake in the company. Now, they're purchasing at $1.75 per share, and it's a 52% premium of TMAX 20-day volume-weighted average. So you think, okay, well, that's a pretty big premium. But if we scan down to the bottom of the article, and we look at the 52-week trading range, at press time in Toronto, TMAX shares were trading at $1.69 within a 52-week range of $0.44 and $6.95. So they're getting it for $1.75 per share, and it was as high as $6.95 in the last year. So just adding to our narrative here, Shandong chairman Chen Yuming described Hope Bay as a highly prospective, high-grade gold camp, which requires substantial investment to optimize production and extend mine life and maximize the value of the camp to the benefit of all stakeholders. It does sound when you dive deep into this story, that they did need money. So maybe they just needed deep pockets. So, you know, maybe it just is what it is. If we just look at some of the numbers here, the latest pre-feasibility study included a 15-year mine life and total recovered gold of 3.1 million ounces for a production rate of just over 200,000 ounces per year with all-in sustaining costs estimated at $986 per ounce. Total reserves are now at 16.9 million tons at 6.5 grams gold per ton for a total of 3.5 million ounces, largely unchanged from the previous year's estimate and contained within measured and indicated resources of 5.2 million ounces. And last year, Hope Bay produced 139,510 ounces of gold. And so there you go. Now, there's just one final thing. I went to the Shadong Gold website just out of curiosity. And They haven't updated the English part of the website since 2018, but luckily I have the Google Translate plugin, and they had updated the news in Chinese. According to Google Translate, the headline is, Opening the door to a golden country. Shandong Gold acquires 100% equity of TMAC resources. So, yeah, so there you have it. Opening the door to a golden country. So I just think we need to be aware and on top of this. And I think the politicians need to be aware and on top of this, which is why I'm sort of leading with this and making an issue of it a little bit more because, you know, we hear all sorts of stories coming out of China. And again, there's a weird tension between this state-run capitalism and a free market capitalism. The contrast couldn't be clearer in a purchase like this, and then when we look at the PNG story. So, not to belabor this, on to our next story. Barrick reports a strong Q1, and they've withdrawn guidance for Pergera. And so, let's take a look at that. Now, Pergera was on the front page of our newspaper, and the big clash between the Prime Minister there. We talked about it in our interview last week. If you missed that, I interviewed Trish Saywell, who is now our official editor-in-chief of the Northern Miner. Yeah, we kind of actually... Dove a bit deep on that one, so check that out if you're interested. And they've been clashing with the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea over uh, environmental and social grounds, 
at the Porgera Mine. And the Porgera Mine is owned by Barrick and Zijin. So Barrick has just had their conference call and they have withdrawn 2020 guidance for the Porgera Mine. I guess that's to be expected. And as a result, the revised group guidance without Porgera for Barrick is between 4.6 million and 5 million ounces of gold, about 200,000 ounces less than its previous guidance of between 4.8 million and 5.2 million ounces. And we have a quote from Barrick CEO Mark Bristow from the conference call, quote, the government's recent response to our engagement towards the extension of the SML came as a surprise. Last week, we filed a lawsuit in the PNG court seeking to quash the government's decision. We received a preliminary order that directed the government to cooperate with our efforts to secure and protect the mine, and also directed the government to engage in negotiations with us to attempt to resolve the matter. The order was very clear for us to engage in a committed way to working to find a solution. Bristow added during the question and answer portion of the call, I'm very committed to finding solutions and spent my entire career working towards ensuring we have constructive partnerships with our stakeholders. So interesting developments there. So they are going to try and work it out at Borgera. And just a quick look at Barrick's numbers. They report a strong start of the year with first quarter gold production and costs consistent with its full year guidance. The company produced 1.25 million ounces of gold at total cash costs of only $692 per ounce and all in sustaining costs of $954 per ounce. Still pretty good. And, and 115 million pounds of copper at cash costs of $1.55 per pound and all in sustaining costs of $2.04 per pound. So they're still making money on the copper. And net earnings came in at $400 million or 22 cents per share, generating free cash flow of $438 million. Company trimmed its debt by 17% to $1.85 billion and they maintained their dividend of 7 cents per share. Okay, so that is Barrick. You have the latest on that. And now let's go to the latest developments in the Russia-US dispute over space mining. And this is from Cecilia Jamazmi uh, from mining.com. Russia is questioning a US proposed global legal framework for mining on the moon, saying the document would have to be examined thoroughly to make sure it complies with international laws before it is officially proposed, the draft agreement called the Artemis Accords would be the latest effort to attract allies to the U.S. National Space Agency's plan to place humans and space stations on the celestial body within the next decade. It also lines up with several public and private initiatives to fulfill the goal of extracting resources from asteroids, the moon, and even other planets. And Significantly, and this is probably Russia's issue, the pact, named after the National Aeronautics Space Administration's new Artemis Moon program, doesn't include Russia among the early partners, people familiar with the proposed pact, told Reuters. The Artemis Accords are expected to propose, quote, safety zones, end quote, that would surround future moon bases. The idea is to prevent damage or interference from rival countries or companies operating in close proximity, Reuters sources said. It also seeks to set a framework under international law for companies to extract and own the resources they mine beyond Earth, and on and on it goes. And it says here that the Kremlin has been pursuing plans in recent years to return to the moon, potentially traveling further into outer space. In 2018, it created the Roscosmos State Corporation for Space Activities, a government-controlled entity responsible for a wide range of space flights and cosmonautics programs for Russia. And President Vladimir Putin has also vowed to launch a mission to Mars, quote, very soon. So it's getting intense out there in the space world, and we are following it every step of the way. And what's beautiful as a mining publication, it's a very important issue for us. We are not stretching our mandate here in the least. So what else do we have? A couple more stories before we get to our Newmont conference call. Anglo-American to spin off South African coal mines. And this is by Cecilia Jamazmi, also from mining.com. Anglo-American is speeding up its exit from thermal coal and plans to spin off its South African coal unit within the next three years. 
mounting pressure from investors, regulators, and environmental organizations has pushed miners to either sell coal assets or to limit their exposure to the fossil fuel in recent years. The diversified miner, which has consistently been offloading coal operations since 2014, said the possible demerger of the South African coal operations was its preferred option. Anglo-American did not rule out other options, such as a trade sale. It sounds like they really want to get rid of it. Chief Executive Officer Mark Kudifani said in February that the company was working towards exiting coal, but didn't provide further details. Quote, we believe that the long-term prospects of our thermal coal operations in South Africa may be best served under different ownership. Yeah, it sounds like they just want to get rid of it. The move, which would leave the company with thermal coal assets only in Colombia, could help it reach an ambitious target to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve energy efficiency by 30% by 2030. While Anglo is moving away from the most polluting kind of coal, metallurgical or coking coal appears to be one of its key commodities moving forward. And just some aspects of the ESG side, some of the world's biggest banks have moved to end coal financing for the sake of the planet. The world's largest trust, Norway's $1 trillion sovereign wealth fund, said last year it would no longer invest in companies that mine more than 20 million tons of coal a year or generate more than 10 gigawatts of power from coal. And BlackRock has also announced plans to limit exposure to the fuel though it's keeping holdings in some of the top producers, including Anglo-American. So there is more on northernminer.com. And finally, I would like to take us to our Rio Tinto story, which we've been following for a few months here. And the headline is Top Investors Face Off Over Rio Tinto's Emissions Cuts. Uh, Rio Tinto's top investors are set to face off at the company's upcoming annual meeting, with only some of them in favor of pushing the miner to extend the range of its targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The world's second largest mining company recently committed to spend $1 billion over the next five years to reduce its carbon footprint and have net zero emissions by 2050. Rio Tinto also said at that time that its total scope one and scope two emissions would be 15% lower by 2030 than 2018 levels. The announcement triggered heated criticism from some investors and environmental advocates, with a group led by a Friends of the Earth's subsidiary tabling a shareholder motion to improve what it calls, quote, weak climate goals. With three days to Rio Tinto's annual meeting, Proxy Investor Institutional Shareholder Services is recommending shareholders support the resolution that asks the miner to also tackle Scope 3 emissions. Remember we are saying, watch out for Scope 3 emissions those generated by customers through the use of its products. Shareholders have a long-term interest in assessing whether Rio Tinto is adequately assessing and acting on its climate risk and opportunities, ISS said in an April 30th note to clients, including through targets to works. Glass Lewis instead wants shareholders to reject the plan at the meeting on Thursday, Bloomberg reports. While Rio Tinto should continue to reduce its own emissions, it's probably not, quote, feasible for the company to set goals based on how its customers determine to utilize its products, end quote, the advisor said in a note to clients last month. Yeah, these scope three emissions, it seems like there's a lot of reach in the scope three emissions. And yeah, that was obvious early on. And finally, Market Force, a subsidiary of activist investor Friends of the Earth, have said that Rio's current plans are, quote, simply a reflection of business as usual. Quote, Rio Tinto is essentially telling its shareholders it is aware of a massive financial liability sitting on its books, but it's planning to manage that risk down, Executive Director Julian Vincent said in March. He noted that Rio Tinto's absolute emissions would have to decline 30% in the next decade to hit the well below 2 degree Celsius global pre-industrial levels outlined in the 2015 Paris Agreement on Climate Change. So there is more. There are analysts. But we must move on to metal prices, which is coming right up. And turning to metal prices, we would like to once again thank our friends from Infomine.com, for providing us with these prices each and every week. 
And on May 12th, gold is at $1,705.26 per ounce, and that is $5 higher than last week's quote. Silver is also higher at $15.53 per ounce, and that is 69 cents higher than last week's quote. Platinum is at $772.08, that is $4 higher than last week's quote. Palladium is at $1,868.85, and that is only $3 higher than last week's quote. And on May 8th, copper is at $2.37 per pound, that is $0.07 cents higher than last week's quote. Aluminum is a penny higher at $0.66 cents per pound. Lead is a penny higher at $0.73 cents per pound, but well off of the dollar of last October. Nickel is $5.56 per pound. That is $0.18 cents higher. Tin is $0.06 cents higher at $6.94 per pound. Cobalt is unchanged at $13.38 per pound. Zinc is $0.05 cents higher at $0.91 cents per pound. Really nothing to write home about that I can see here. Uh, precious metals have inched a little bit higher, and industrial metals are doing the same thing. So a mild reflation, but nothing dramatic. And those are your metal prices. And coming up, we have the Newmont conference call. Some highlights that I found that I found are of particular interest, and it features Tom Palmer, who is CEO and president of Newmont Mining, and Rob Atkinson has a cameo at the end where he talks about robots. He is the chief operating officer. I think this is a real interesting window into really uh, one of the favored gold companies of Wall Street, from what I can tell. And they're doing a lot of things, and they're minting money over there. So let's tune in. I hope you enjoy this. There's a three excerpts, so I'll be chiming in here and there uh, just to give you guidance on what's going on and what has been said. Other than that, I will see you on the other side. To date, Newmont has no confirmed cases of COVID-19 at any of its sites, thanks to the discipline of our workforce in adhering to these protocols. I am incredibly proud of the way our employees have responded to these challenging times. In addition to their strict adherence to our protocols, they have further demonstrated their commitment by joining the fight against this pandemic in the communities where they live and work. We not only want to protect our people and host communities, we want to build lasting re resiliency so that our host communities can thrive after the worst of this pandemic passes. As a global business with operations in eight countries, we are committed to doing our part to combat this disease and protect our people and their livelihoods. The strength of our business and maintaining robust relationships not only allow us to endure short-term disruptions, they allow us to reach beyond our sites to create value and improve lives for all of our stakeholders. Associated with this commitment, we have made two important decisions. First, we have committed to maintain pay for all of our employees through until at least the end of June to support them and their families and remove short-term uncertainty. And second, we established a $20 million global community support fund to help host communities, governments and employees. The Newmont Global Community Support Fund builds upon our other local contributions and efforts we have made over the last two months. With input from local stakeholders, we have identified three focus areas to ensure that our financial support will have the most positive impact and reach those who need it most. These three focus areas are employee and community health, food security and local economic resilience. We will closely monitor the progress and outcomes of our support so that we are able to fine tune and improve results along the way with a view to serving as a catalyst for long term resiliency and future community development. Turning to slide five for a framework on how we are preparing for multiple scenarios. 
As the COVID-19 pandemic continues to evolve, our deep bench of experienced leaders and proven operating model continue to serve as a competitive advantage. We are proactively planning for and evaluating short, medium and long-term risk through a comprehensive framework that involves the following actions. Mapping the virus in each of our countries in order to be prepared for a safe and efficient return to more normal operations. For 2020, we're assuming the greatest impact to operations and financial performance could occur during the second quarter. However, we're also planning for other scenarios where we could see a resurgence of the virus later in 2020 and early 21. And finally, we're evaluating a lower likelihood scenario where there is a recurring seasonal impact from the virus. We are currently in wave one, and while there is an increasing likelihood for a wave two, we remain optimistic the worst of the pandemic will have passed in the coming weeks after worldwide efforts to contain or suppress the spread of the virus begin to take hold. We are ramping up operations at Cerro Negro, Eleanor and Yanacocha, and assuming Penasquito is able to ramp up in the coming weeks, our 2020 gold production will be towards the lower end of our previous guidance, or approximately 6 million attributable gold ounces, whilst costs are tracking towards the higher end of the guidance range. In terms of our capital spend, we are still progressing the majority of our development and sustaining capital projects, with our key projects progressing on schedule. These key projects include Tanami Expansion 2, the development of sub-level shrinkage mining method at Sabika Underground, and our laybacks at Boddington and Ahafo. However, our capital overall is trending lower than our original guidance, as we have reduced non-essential activities and spending in areas where we were significantly ahead of schedule. For exploration, approximately 80% of our budget is allocated to near mine activity, and a lot of that work is continuing. However, we have put our greenfield exploration on hold. Our definitive feasibility study work continues to advance remotely for both Yanacocha sulphides and Ahafo North. We will provide further clarity on our 2020 outlook when Penasquito begins to ramp up. However, it's worth noting that our guidance for 2021 through 2024 still stands. Despite the disruption from COVID-19, we are well positioned to withstand this pandemic. And most importantly, Newmont's long-term value proposition remains unchanged. So that is Tom Palmer, President and CEO. And we walked in halfway through his discussion on coronavirus. Um, and now he's going to talk about his global portfolio, including uh, dividends and stock buybacks. So here it is. Take a listen. Within our portfolio of 12 operating mines and two joint ventures, we have an unmatched eight world-class assets, each of which deliver more than 500,000 ounces of consolidated production per year, at all in sustaining costs of less than $900 per gold equivalent ounce and a mine life that exceeds 10 years. Importantly, particularly in the current context, all are located in top tier jurisdictions that we define as countries classified in the A and B rating ranges by each of Moody's, S&P and Fitch. In addition to our eight existing world-class assets, Newmont has two emerging world-class assets in Yanacocha and Mirian. These emerging assets within our portfolio offer substantial upside through further optimisation and development over the coming years. Turning to slide seven, we'll look at our production for the next decade. Our stable production profile will generate more than six million ounces of gold per year for the next 10 years. Underpinned by our world-class assets, and further supported by our industry-leading exploration program and organic project pipeline. This profile is further enhanced with over $1.5 billion per year in additional revenue from producing between 1.2 to 1.4 million gold equivalent ounces from co-products, with silver, lead and zinc from Penasquito and copper from Boddington. Combined, we will deliver nearly 8 million gold equivalent ounces per year, the most of any company in our industry. Turning to our free cash flow generation potential on slide eight, we expect to generate substantial free cash flow throughout the gold price cycle. For every $100 increase in gold price above our base assumption, Newmont delivers approximately $400 million of incremental attributable free cash flow per year. 
using our conservative $1,200 gold price planning assumption, our free cash flow would still total more than $5 billion over the next five years. And at current gold prices, our portfolio will generate around $15 billion of free cash flow over the same five-year time frame. In addition, we have the potential for further upside with tailwinds from favourable oil prices and foreign currency exchange rates. The excess free cash we generate will be used to reduce our net debt and provide additional returns to shareholders. Looking forward, we are well positioned to continue executing our capital priorities and staying focused on creating long-term value. Turning to slide nine for a review of our performance against our promises. Simply put, Newmont is delivering on its commitments. With world-class assets in top-tier jurisdictions, gold industry's best production profile of more than six million gold ounces per year for the next decade, and the industry's largest gold reserve base of 96 million ounces, we are firmly positioned for long-term success. In a little over a year since acquiring Gold Corp, we have already realised significant value. We originally committed to delivering $365 million per year in synergies by the end of 2021, but are now on track to realise $500 million of cash flow improvements in 2021, an increase of nearly 40% for accelerating G&A and exploration synergies along with higher than planned full potential improvements. It's worth noting that these cash flow improvements do not include our share of synergies from the Nevada Gold Mines joint venture. We have received $1.4 billion in total cash proceeds from divestments, meeting our target of $1 to $1.5 billion. And our commitment to leading shareholder returns remains stronger than ever as we returned our first quarterly dividend of 25 cents per share. Turning to slide 10 for a look at our first quarter highlights. The strength of both our strategy and operating model is shown through our solid first quarter performance, despite the impacts and disruptive nature of the COVID-19 pandemic. In the first quarter, we produced nearly 1.5 million ounces of gold at all in sustaining costs of $1,030 per ounce. And we also produced 339,000 gold equivalent ounces from co-products. We generated operating cash flow of $935 million and free cash flow of $611 million. And we continued to progress our full potential program across our portfolio with a particular focus on the more than $240 million in value we've identified at Penasquito, Cerro Negro and our mines in Canada. During the quarter, we continued to strengthen our investment grade balance sheet receiving $1.4 billion in proceeds after completing the sale of KCGM, Continental Gold and Red Lake. We refinanced approximately $1 billion of debt through the issuance of new senior notes at historically low coupon of 2.25% and we lowered our net debt to adjusted EBITDA ratio to 0.7 times. Newmont has one of the strongest balance sheets in the gold sector with $3.7 billion of cash and total liquidity of $6.6 billion. In April, our board approved a 79% increase to our quarterly dividend to $0.25 cents per share from $0.14 cents per share. Newmont's first quarter dividend will provide investors with the highest dividend yield of any senior gold miner and is a testament to our financial flexibility, balance sheet strength and conviction in the stability of our business. We also continued to execute our buyback program during the first quarter, buying back approximately $300 million worth of shares. In total, we have now retired $800 million or nearly 19 million shares at an average price of just over $42 per share since initiating this program only five months ago. An excellent outcome. With that, I'll turn it over to our Chief Operating Officer, Rob, on slide 11 to review our operational performance. So again, that was Tom Palmer discussing the financials out of Newmont. And yes, before we get to the robots with Rob Atkinson, the COO, he does talk about the Eleanor and the Muscle White mines. Eleanor is in Quebec and Muscle White is in Ontario. And also how that's affecting the First Nations and 
the relationship between the company and the First Nations. At Eleanor, we ramped down activities on March the 23rd to comply with the Quebec government's restriction on non-essential travel within the province in order to mitigate the risk of transmission to northern and remote First Nations communities. Following the directive given by the Quebec government on April the 13th, mining activities are no longer restricted. We have been working closely with the Cree First Nation Grand Council and the Cree Health Board to determine an acceptable path forward that protects our employees and communities as we take the risk of transmission of the virus from other Canadian hubs into communities very seriously. Just last week, we agreed a path forward and have begun ramping up operations at Eleanor. And at Musselwhite, we proactively moved to care and maintenance on March the 23rd in order to minimize fly-in, fly-out activity to prevent the possible transmission of the virus into communities including nearby First Nations communities in northern Ontario. We are developing plans to safely and efficiently resume operations. And last but not least, the best for last, we have automation. Well, it depends where you are. If you're uh, working in these mines, you might not be so excited about the automation. Although there may be jobs coming with the automation on the other side of this. So anyway, hear what Newmont's up to with automation at their mines. Across Newmont, we are very committed to continually improve our safety performance and utilize technology where it makes sense to do so. One great example is the industry-leading robotic technology for diamond rig drilling we are deploying at Tanamine, which removes our employees from the line of fire when drilling and removes the fatality risk associated with equipment entanglement. During 2020, we will integrate five robotic rigs to the fleet and we will replicate this impressive technology at other Newmont underground sites globally. And there you have it, the Newmont Conference Call Q1 2020 highlights and excerpts. And uh, yeah, we always try and have an educational feel here at the Northern Miner. And uh, I hope you learn something from that. I sure do each time I listen to this uh, on several levels. It's not just mining, learn about finance and public companies and just how it all works. So with that, thank you once again for joining us. And feel free to share this with your friends. Leave us a review in the Apple Podcast directory. Until next week, take care.